Hey everybody, I'm recording live right now on twitch.tv slash the android dungeon, which is where we do our live stream um, office hours. Uh, we were unable to come to class today because my daughter's been sick for the last few days and uh, I don't want to uh, potentially spread things around. I don't, I don't know what she's, we're waiting on some tests. She's resting downstairs my wife is home she's downstairs she's got her mommy and i'm going to sit up here and take care of some business what we want to do today is actually continue talking about our global organization strategies as we build our outline and remember this sunday our global outline is due um which as we discussed on monday uh, is, in effect, a list of paragraphs that you want to write for your paper. We want to keep things tight. We want to keep things focused. We want to keep things, I'm not going to say minimal, but we want to keep things uh, very simple in the way we're labeling them just so that we can see a macro view of the big picture. That's why it's, it's global organization. We want to be able to see everything on one page. Um, we want to keep things nice and neat and clean and organized. Now, if you weren't in class on Monday, we did talk about this in detail. We went over the assignment sheet, checkpoint assignment number 10. You can see that on Canvas. And you can follow along the steps that we took in class uh, 10.1, which helped everyone right down to formatting the document uh, with starting that process. And that's what we did in class on Monday. Um, so if you haven't gotten that far, make sure you do that before you move on to 10.2, uh, which is what we're doing today. Now, I do want to reiterate before we move on that uh, organization and formatting is key. Um, it is really important that we keep things organized, neat, easy to read, not just for my sake, but for your own sake. Um, because we want to be able to easily parse things out. So as you see in my example on Canvas, uh, I want you to follow my lead in terms of formatting, uh, in terms of formatting the document, in terms of labeling each of your paragraphs. Uh, again, so that it's easier for me to read while I'm grading it, and therefore easier for me to understand where your paper is headed, but also easier for yourself. Um, because like with all of these checkpoint assignments, they are tools that we're using to better prepare ourselves uh, for the drafting process. And as we've shifted from the annotated bibliography to the Talman frames and now to the organization side of things, uh, I think a lot of people are probably finding that um, hopefully not a harsh wake up call, but a very clear indication that the more work you've been doing along the way, the easier the next step is going to be. And so we want to make sure that we are considering everything from all different directions. If you are struggling with this aspect of it, if you're struggling with the organization, you're not sure what to write about still, um, you need to reach out to me. I am having conferences tomorrow um, with individual students via Zoom. Um, so I've already started signing some folks up for that. So if you want one, uh, you're going to need to reach out sooner rather than later. So maybe we can maybe we can squeeze you in um, and I can talk to people directly as they're working. Um, but as a quick recap of what we did on Monday, we basically looked at the left hand side of the Talman frame. Um, we established a nested outline. Um, and, and we'll, I'll, I'll bring us back real quick so we can actually see that um, what we did in class yesterday. Just to remind everybody, um, we were on 10.1, getting started with our global organization. And if you scroll all the way down here, you can see my example that I've been building alongside everybody uh, as we move through the semester. Um, and this is ultimately what I want your outline to look like okay uh, as it stands right now uh, each letter uh, here you can see the sub list on the multi-level list option on Microsoft Word 
each of these letters represents an individual paragraph. Right now, our introduction is simply a single paragraph um, that is that its goal is to forward our main claim. And we can talk more about introductions as we get there along the way. Going back up to the top, um, we, you could see where we, where we kind of started, which was more or less starting with an introduction, ending with a conclusion, and then creating more or less sections of our paper with supporting reasons. Now these supporting reasons, you may have uh, multiple supporting reasons. You may have one supporting reason like I do in my case. Um, although I could easily reorganize this uh, by labeling things differently, um, you know, since I only have one reason, I could easily label this as my reason number one, this is my reason number two, this is my reason number three, and, and not much would change, all right? Um, so, so keep that in mind. There's not really necessarily a correct answer that I'm looking for. Um, if I see a sentence on here, I'm not going to say, well, that's not... That's not grounds. That's a reason. It's, it's all in how you use these things. And that's why I want you to label them. So I want to know how you're thinking of it, right? Are you thinking of this as a reason? Are you thinking of this as grounds? Are you thinking of this as background information? Is this a warrant that you're going to address? And that's where we are so far. That's how far we've gotten uh, basically the left-hand side of the Tallman frame. Today, we want to talk about the right-hand side of the Tallman frame, conditions of rebuttal, uh, anticipating audience needs, because remember that Tallman um, argued that, you know, a good argument is a good argument is a good argument, but it needs to be flexible so that we can anticipate audience needs, that we can um, keep in mind that there's always the possibility of a skeptical audience. And that skeptical audience, we want to be able to entertain their skepticisms. Skepticisms. We want to be able to uh, acknowledge and validate their skepticisms while simultaneously strengthening our own argument. So we are going to dive into that. I have made this uh, already published, so you're going to be able to follow along on Canvas. Maybe you're just listening to my voice. Maybe you're just uh, following along with the video. Either way, um, I want to dive right into this topic of anticipating audience needs. Um, these notes um, I have written, but it, it may, it, like any time in class, it may seem like I'm just reading along, um, which is largely what I meant. But this is, these are my lecture notes, right? So I am lecturing from these notes. Um, but as it says here, one of the key reasons for identifying your audience's core needs, beliefs, values, shared experiences, perspectives, i.e. their warrants, is because when you're constructing your argument for them, um, that's where your logos is derived, that you need to know how they're going to react. Um, we've already talked a little bit about that in regards to our warrants, um, thinking about which values of our own that we're going to address that we feel like is important that we need to um, either bring out into the forefront or um, actually argue in favor of. Um, but this is sort of the other side of that coin where we're thinking in terms of um, weeks ago when we discussed argumentation as a conversation, right? You're entering into conversation, not just using your critical imperative as a launching point, but using other voices in the conversation, whether they be hypothetical, published, um, an amalgamation of things, um, you can anticipate what they're going to say and you can respond when you feel like that's appropriate. The, the, the key there is to identify when your audience may have issues, questions, or responses to what you're saying. Now, some of these issues, responses, questions, that's going to be covered by your warrants backing. There's going to be a lot of overlap with your warrants, right? The reason you're um, theoretically addressing some warrants is because there would be a disagreement between your values and their values, right? So that's going to counteract some of those differences in you and your audience's differing values there. And there are a lot of strategies, but beyond merely identifying warrants and backing your own ideas, we can also think about it in terms of um, refuting an opposing view, meaning you attempt to convince readers that its argument is logically flawed, inadequately supported, or based on erroneous assumptions or wrong values. So you're not just saying, well, it's a difference of opinion, man. It's not just a difference of opinion. It is okay to say, no, you're wrong. You're factually wrong, right? Um, arguing about 
vaccine efficacy is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of one person is right and one person is wrong. Um, so there are situations where it's appropriate to do that. Uh, you can um, refute the writer's stated reason and grounds, the writer's warrant and backing, or both. But either way, um, it is possible to directly um, address their argument. Now, this is where sometimes it works best to have some kind of published opinion that you can communicate with. Um, finding some kind of opinion piece, um, argument of another kind, even as even as something as as simple as as something like a social media post or a meme. Although we'll get into sort of what what issues might come along with that, but the hypothetical argument, right? It, it, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of temptation there to create a straw man that can easily be pushed over. And so one of the ways that you can strengthen your own ethos is by using those published uh, voices in the conversation and say, well, hey, so-and-so over here in their editorial for the Washington Post um, feels differently than I do, but I got to say they're wrong, I, and here's why, right? So it's about creating almost a sub-argument inside your own argument that you feel like you need to respond to. Let's take a look at uh, here some strategies for rebutting the evidence. Now, sometimes you anticipate a response that you feel like is incorrect based on false information, assumptions, outdated ideas, uh, that you feel like you have a strong counterclaim in response to your audience's potential attacks. Um, here are some strategies, and it's very, very simple. Um, you know, a lot of times, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about does statements on Friday, but we're talking about describing um, more or less explicitly what a paragraph is doing um, rhetorically in your argument. So these are all strategies that you can accomplish um, by, by simple, plain language. Um, these things are okay to do. Uh, and that is a question I get a lot with students. They're, they're not sure what's okay to write, what's allowed, what's, um, what's you know, rhetorically sound. So the, here's, here's a list of strategies that you can use um, denying the truth of their data, right? Um, specifically, when you're looking at maybe a, a counter argument or an alternative viewpoint that's published, it's really easy to point to their evidence or to their um, data that they're using for their claims and, and actually argue and say, well, here's where there's a flaw in your data, either in the way you're interpreting them, maybe it's outdated, something like that. You can also cite counter examples and counter testimony. Maybe your um, opponent is arguing that something is an absolute when it isn't. You can easily say, well, that's not true in all cases. Here's some counter examples, um, some counter testimony. Casting doubt on the representative or sufficiency of examples um, or casting doubt on the relevance or recency of examples, statistics, uh, or testimony. That's something that we've used actually in class when I was explaining the dangers of statistics in your research. What I was doing to that secondary research, I can do that at any time when somebody is coming at me and saying, well, uh, actually you're wrong because of this statistic over here. Well, I can say that that statistic is flawed and here's why. Calling into question the credibility of an authority actually goes back to a lot of our research evaluation strategies, and we can think about it in terms of uh, not only questioning the things that we're using as evidence, uh, but also calling into that question in any counter arguments that we may, um, that we may encounter. Um, either calling into question the reliability of their sources or arguing against the credibility of the counter arguer themselves. Um, to go back to my vaccine example, a lot of people who are making bad faith arguments about the efficacy of even something as simple as the flu shot would likely uh, not have the authority to even make claims like that. They're, they're citing authority, right? You have a lot of people who cite authority, um, like nurses, um, maybe general practitioners have that kind of baked in authority because they're in the medical field, but they may necessarily not have the authority to speak on something like uh, epidemics or something like that, right? Their, their knowledge is, is, is 
is strong in in the medical field in some ways, but it's also limited based on their experience and their their specialty. So it is it is you are it is okay to bring that up. Um, also, questioning the accuracy or context of quotations kind of goes back to sort of what we were talking about in statistics. Anytime there's a counter argument that you have, follow up on their sources, right? Don't take their word for it. They may be wrong. They may be taking it out of context. They may be cherry picking examples, um, or they may just be misinterpreting it, mis misunderstanding a source and basing their argument on that. Um, also, Questioning the way statistical data was produced or interpreted, not just the specificness of those statistics, but also looking into the methodology and when those numbers, where those numbers even came from. So like I said, all of these are strategies for rebutting evidence. If somebody comes with a counter argument um, that you feel like is in direct opposition to what you're claiming, it's okay to bring up that you just, just, just disagree. And it's also okay uh, to point out when people are wrong, because sometimes people are wrong. Now, the next idea, though, we want to think about is conceding to opposing views. Now, sometimes you're going to find yourself conceding to a part of the resistant audience's argument because it's something that you just can't refute. This is basically the opposite. That doesn't make your argument weak or necessarily make your argument invalid. Concession actually shows ethos in that you are fair and willing to admit weaknesses in your own argument. You are showing that your reader, uh, showing to your reader that you have considered it from all uh, angles, that you've done a broad scope of research, and you are acknowledging that it isn't a slam dunk. It isn't something that is... Uh, foolproof, uh, one-size-fits-all kind of argument. But that's still going to strengthen your ethos because your reader is going to feel like, well, they're doing their due diligence and they still feel the same way. Well, then that is truth-seeking, right? So if you make a concession, it's your task to show that the benefits of your claim still outweigh the negative aspects. Um, that involves attempting to sway their values in some ways. And like I said, there's going to be a lot of overlap when it comes to warrants um, in, in these kinds of counter arguments. So rather than trying to refute their re reasons or warrants, you are trying to shift the focus onto a different warrant that you both can share. So for example that I have here um, on this page, arguing for the legalization of hard drugs like cocaine and heroin, adversaries would argue that that would lead to more drug users and addicts. Um, they, in fact, have passed laws similar to this, um, I believe, in Oregon. Um, just last year, they passed uh, some, some similar legalization laws um, as have been passed by uh, states in regards to marijuana, that it was still... <clears throat> sort of criminalized at a federal level, but not at the local level. It was, the intention was to actually help addicts and to create a, uh, um, a, an environment where incarceration is not the answer, but treatment, right? Just to give some context to that example. So you may be able to dispute the size of their numbers, but you know, you can, you can agree to the logic, right? If something is legal, to own and use, um, logic follows that people who were afraid to use it or try it before um, would then potentially try it now because there were no legal repercussions. I mean, I, I'm okay with the logic of that, right? So reluctantly agreeing to that logic isn't going to weaken your claim, but you could come back with a counter-counter argument, right? And what you could do is state that while you admit that legalizing hard drugs would lead to more potential users and addicts, it would cut down on, say, black market trade, violent drug-related crime, um, mass incarceration. You know, maybe those things outweigh the cost of higher addiction rates, right? Um, an addict can be treated, um, but a criminal record sticks around for the rest of your life, right? Um and, and so maybe that's something that, that you could say, you know, ultimately what we want is the same thing. People to lead healthy, happy lives, contributing to society in productive, responsible ways. What's the best way to achieve that, right? And you can still say, while, yes, people using drugs and getting addicted is bad, there potentially are worse things societally that go along with the criminalization of drugs. 
Um, so we get so what you're seeing is that you're switching the focus onto a warrant that both sides can agree on. Violent crimes need to redo, be reduced. Mass incarceration is a bad thing. Um, then you can still add to your own argument while conceding to that opposing view. Now, that may not convince some people in your audience. And I think this is what, what a lot of people don't realize about good argumentation is that you don't need it. You don't need your audience to 100% agree with you every time. A positive, responsible argument presents a side of the argument as valid. And your opposing audience can either accept that argument and agree with you, or they can accept your argument as valid and still disagree with you. Both of those are still successful arguments. So when you anticipate that a reader who is attacking your reasons and grounds has a point and you'd like to concede that point. And like I said, once again, concession is a sign of ethos. There are a few ways that you can go about responding. Obviously, you want to remain tactful and respectful, but firm in your position. Being respectful, being tactful, like I said, validating other people's points of view strengthens your ethos. People don't like listening when you're being snarky, when you're being hostile, when you're being overly defensive. Um, that can damage your ethos uh, in ways that are uh, much harder to recover from. You can draw attention to an element of the point that you and your audience do agree on. Uh, this can be a theoretical underpinning, a broader concept, a smaller aspect of it. Whatever finding that common ground can be incredibly, incredibly important. You can also shift the focus of your argument onto something that you and your audience can agree on more. Uh, this balance shows your views and show that you can accept their opposition while stating that in the big picture, it still doesn't change your mind, uh, that you're willing to accept the downsides for the potential upsides of any potential argument. So what does all this mean? It really gives us a lot of options, options that you don't necessarily have to take in every single argument, but they're tools in your arsenal that are critical uh, for showing that you are considering your audience needs, that you're considering other viewpoints and other voices in the conversation, and that you're able to navigate around those. Those are actually skills that you have to uh, sort of display when you're writing this paper. So when you're looking at all of these tools in your toolbox, you may not have even considered some of these things yet, but in all likelihood during the course of your research, um, <clears throat> you found some of those opposing views. We don't have to address every single opposing view. Some of them are more reasonable opposing views than others. It's okay to ignore opposing views that you feel like are unreasonable, irrational, or maybe would take you too far off topic. But showing that you're able to do that and that you're willing to do that uh, to some degree is going to strengthen the ethos of your paper. So what does that mean for our outline? Our next step in creating a global outline um, would be to look at the remaining areas of your Tallman frame. Those are labeled the conditions of rebuttal, and we have labeled conditions of rebuttal for both our claim and reasons and grounds, but also our warrants and backing. Anything that you anticipate that your audience may say to the contrary to your argument, where they may be attacking, rebutting, or being skeptical. Um, here, ultimately, you need to answer a few questions with your outline when deciding on what to integrate into your paper. Um, which of the conditions of rebuttal from your Tallman frames are significant enough that they need to be addressed, uh, that you feel like are um, important, relevant, and reasonable counter arguments or conditions of rebuttal that you feel like need to be addressed. If they feel like you need, if you feel like you need to address them, then you have to ask yourself, how are you going to respond, rebuttal or concession? Um, and then, of course, where? Where are we going to put that? Now, the strategy we're employing related to anticipating your audience's counterargument is in creating moments in your paper where you refute a counterargument before it can happen. Uh, this is called planting a naysayer. What we talked about on Monday is the idea of organization guiding a reader through the argument. And the less sort of brain power they have to use in order to follow that argument, the better. 
So that means if a reader is sitting there preoccupied with a question, preoccupied with a concern, a counter argument, some kind of skepticism, they're not really listening to what they're reading. They're not paying attention. They're building a resistance and a defensiveness to your argument that, again, is going to be difficult to overcome. So it's always a good idea to plant a naysayer in your paper exactly when your reader might actually have those concerns. Now the trick is to anticipate flaws that your resistant audience may see in your argument. Uh, where might there be weaknesses in your reasons or evidence? Uh, how would the resistant audience respond to your use of reasons and evidence? Now if you can foresee that response, you can create a paragraph uh, or even just a sentence or two mentioning in passing, clarifying some detail, uh, presenting some extra evidence, uh, acknowledging the weakness and stating that in the grand scheme of things it doesn't matter. Um, such as the addiction issue that I, I brought up previously. In most, time, most situations, the time to address questions and concerns is at the moment those questions or concerns arise. So if you have a paragraph that is identifying something the audience will be skeptical about, uh, address that concern in that paragraph, or at the very least, the next paragraph. So our goal then would be to decide where to integrate the conditions of rebuttal into our outline. Uh, like warrants, some objections or concerns can be addressed within an existing paragraph, um, a few sentences mentioning it in passing, even a phrase here or there can, can and, w and as we talk about drafting, we can talk about the subtleties of it, but um, sometimes it requires like a full sub argument, like I mentioned. And so that, that might require its own additional evidence or explanation uh, and therefore need its own paragraph. So when anticipating audience concerns for your main claim uh, or your argument overall, uh, these can be paragraphs that can come before your reasons even start. Um, after your introduction, at the very end of your essay, before the conclusion, you can provide a section where you sort of contextualize your entire argument. Um, maybe providing background information, clarifying a definition, answering some overall question that's likely to be in the forefront of your audience's minds. That's going to require their own paragraphs. Um, I've often I've often characterized planting a naysayer as moments in your in your essay where you're actually taking a step back and say like, okay, I, I look, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, right? And that might be where that needs to happen. When you're anticipating audience concerns about your reasons, your grounds, your warrants, your backing, those kinds of things, you're asking which you're so, um, asking which both strategy uh, is most beneficial to your argument, rebutting or conceding, um, as well as where the most appropriate place to address that in your outline. So you can sort of tuck that into your list of paragraphs that you've already got going. So remember, you want to address audience concerns as soon as they are likely to come up in their minds. So if you can predict that when the question or concern will arise, that's where you're going to uh, address those conditions of rebuttal. So you can take that time uh, to integrate the conditions of rebuttal into your global outline in progress. Here's the example of what mine looks like with those things added in. This is simply the uh, final example from Monday with more things added in. Notice I've labeled them COR or conditions of rebuttal and indicated whether I will be rebutting or conceding a point. Uh, to in response to that skepticism. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to start painting that into my paragraphs here. Uh, you can see the first one I bring up is actually um, with this first warrant that playing video games is fun, relaxing, enjoyable. I'm willing to concede that some of them are stressful. Some of them are violent. Some of them are competitive. They're not for everybody. And there's a lot of different types. Of, so I feel like it's important I could say that in passing, right, because this is about my perspective, my value, but I can show my reader very clearly um, that I'm aware that this is not the only way. I'm not arguing that everybody should find them relaxing. I'm merely arguing that I find them relaxing um, and that uh, even then there's still some video games that stress me out. They, they still stress me out sometimes, depending on the genre, depending on the mood I'm in, right, well, how patient I'm feeling at the moment. Um, so there is that. Here we have uh, our millennials, the video game generation. I've decided here addressing cultural scare, the morality panic. I had that listed in my Tallman frame, um, and I feel like that might be where I put that there because the video game generation, the idea that um, uh, 
you know, I came of age during a time when video games were becoming popular, becoming a mainstream uh, thing where we were transitioning from a culture that viewed video games as toys or uh, a fad that was passing uh, and would die out eventually into something that was, you know, sort of more mainstream and accepted as something that was going to be around. And so um, I might need to talk about some of those things that some people still feel to this day um, about the morality scare. So uh, that might be where I go there. Now, this is one of those examples where if I get in there and I'm start writing that paragraph, I might find I need a lot more than just that paragraph. I might need to do some more research. I, I might end up having a lot to say on this and, and I might have some more decisions to make down the road. But for now... I've decided to attach that condition of rebuttal specifically to that um, to that point that I'm making. Same thing here. Collect video games, play them frequently. Are they a waste of time and money? Um, I think that's something, you know, somebody would look at, say, like the volume of video games that I own, uh, the frequency at which I buy them. Right. And I, I tend to be pretty thrifty about it, but I've, I've got a lot. And, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, I do not understand what you spend your money on. And so it, it may be required to be like, look, I, people spend their their dispendable income on a lot of things. What makes them happy? Um, or as I uh, had told my mom many years ago, hey, I, I don't smoke. So <laughs> I could be I could spend 20 dollars a week on cigarettes instead. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's where that, uh, that point could be attached pretty easily. Um, and, and, um, that, that, that's what we're going for there. Uh, also here you can see in uh, paragraph G, the negative perception about video gamers, um, specifically, uh, tying that into the idea of, um, playing video games as identity. I, I don't really feel like even though I play video games a lot and just by virtue of um, my office hours and, and the paper that I'm writing here alongside you, it may seem like uh, it's it's a much bigger part of my personality than it actually is. Um, and I think maybe that's that's the point to, to bring that up, right? That it's a hobby. That's something I do in my free time when I have free time. Um, and it's something that uh, I enjoy doing, but that's um, there's a lot of other negative kind of connotations that come along with that and uh i think maybe this is the point in which we um we try to argue against that and then uh our video games art i feel like maybe that would be something that i need to expand on a little bit more um and and it, it's something i might i might drop out of the paper it might feel irrelevant by that point um, maybe I put it into the conclusion. I don't know. But for right now, uh, I took that from my Talman frame and I gave it its own paragraph. I also put it at the end because I felt like it was something that was a big enough picture, uh, a broad enough topic that it would work to sort of transition from the more personal stuff into my conclusion, the more personal stuff into a more theoretical idea. So that's why I put that at the end. But there's still a lot of decisions that could be made. Uh, a lot of things that I've chosen to put on my outline here that, that could get cut, it could get minimized, it could be expanded, moved around. Um, and that's really the important part to think about the outlining process. Um, what I want to do on Friday, actually, is to bring people into class with their outline, more or less at this stage, and actually just share them with our um with our peers and and look into it a little bit more deeply um, from another perspective um, in terms of anticipating audience responses, uh, in terms of questions that they may have, uh, the order that the paragraphs are in. All of these are decisions that are made based on uh, a potential audience's reaction. And so I think maybe we could do that for each other. Um, when you get to this point, you want to take some steps for personal assessment. Take a step back. Take a look at your global outline and process. May remember that you should have uh, one or more supporting reasons broken down into a list of paragraphs that you'll write and use to explain each supporting reason. You should be addressing grounds for each supporting reason. You should have decided which warrants require addressing and where you would like to address them. Be sure to include warrants in paragraphs that are obviously related or connected in some way. You should also have integrated conditions of rebuttal into your argument, either in existing paragraphs or in new ones. 
and indicate whether you are rebutting a counter argument or conceding a point to your skeptical audience. Uh, and again, you should not feel locked into any of these decisions. When you come into class on Friday, I expect your uh, outline to be at this point. Okay, I want you to have done a majority of this work for this checkpoint assignment prior to Friday's class so we can get some feedback. You should also continue to address um, key global organization questions. Uh, are they in the most logical order for my audience to understand my argument? You know, some arguments take a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, some of them start small and, and broaden their scope as they go. Some go vice, you know, vice versa. It's up to you what order your paragraphs go in. I just want you to have a reason so that when you come in on Friday and share with your um, your peer in class, you're able to explain that. You're able to say, well, this is why they're in this order, much like I was doing while I was walking through that um, example there. Uh, I want you to be able to do that with yours. <clears throat> so make sure you assess the order of your paragraphs that you have down. Um, again, I've reassessed the order of my paragraphs. I may still need to change things, but it makes more sense. Um, I've also graduated a point to its own supporting reason. Uh, it feels like the next logical step in my argument uh, for my first reason in support of my overall claim. Uh, since it wasn't in my Talmud frame, I decided to do it this way, right? So again, I've, I've kind of reorganized what was already there and I sort of relabeled it. So again, I've decided maybe I need to contextualize my argument first. I've moved the paragraphs about millennials being the video game um, generation, addressing that cultural scare, my morality panic. I moved that up and I've given it more or less its own section of the paper to contextualize my argument, basically anticipating an audience question or concern. Um, reason number one, um, the focal point of my room is my video game collection, exemplified by my original NES. Um, and then here are uh, the arguments. And then I've graduated that one uh, thing that I, w I had labeled as grounds into its own reason. The central theme of my room is video gaming, right? Still talking about my personal space and how that's rooted in childhood and nostalgia. But again, we've shifted from just this one item, exemplifying that idea and transitioning into the bigger picture in here. Um, so again, I've kind of relabeled some of my grounds, um, given its own grounds. Uh, I've created new grounds to go along with this reason. Layout of my room is to facilitate gaming. Much of the space up is taken up by screens, consoles, and storage for games, right? Those are things that weren't in my Talman frame, but... I feel like it's something that's worth talking about. And so I've taken, you know, more or less this right here, F, and I've created a whole section of the paper around it because I knew while I was assessing that I was, I was going to, you know, go into further detail about this. And as you can see, I don't really have any more paragraphs. I have... You know, introduction one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight body paragraphs. Here you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine body paragraphs. It's actually still the same general length that I was anticipating, um, but I've added things. I've moved things around. I've assessed my outline at this point, and it's starting to become a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, concrete. And again, I can still things to be in flux. It's okay. Um, moving from global outlining to the next step, you may realize that things need to be cut down. Things need to be expanded. Things need to be removed completely. I may find next week that the conversation surrounding video games being art, that might be something. It's just too big a can of worms to open in this small of a paper. So I might just cut it. I might decide that this contextualization works better later. I, I don't know. Maybe I put it in between my two reasons. I don't know. I might change my mind and just put it back as one paragraph inside another reason. But it's looking fuller. It's looking more developed. It's looking more organized. We may want to take a last step to look at what we have and assess on Friday. We want to do that uh, before we finish it up and turn it in this weekend. But ultimately what you're looking at right here on the screen, 
this final example that I have right here is what I want yours to look like. Not the same number of reasons, not the same number of, um, not the same number of uh, paragraphs uh, or anything like that, right? It's just possibilities, okay? Um, and I think with that, I'm going to turn finish up this video uh, that was about a 40 minute explanation it would have gone a little bit longer in class uh, with student questions or uh, hands-on kind of time allowing you to follow along but feel free to pause this video as you work alongside it uh, to develop this part of your paper and come in on Friday uh, ready to re review that get some feedback and uh, ask any questions that you may have okay I'll see you on Friday.